Hey everybody, Professor Davis here at ChemSurvival.com, the YouTube channel Chem Survival, and it's time for another Table Tuesday. And today we're going to follow up on our conversation from last week where we discussed the origin of the no of the name transition metals or the, the term transition metals. Now, recall that this term dates back to more than 100 years ago when the Bohr model of the atom was still the most sophisticated model that we had. And it was realized that while electrons do fill energy levels or shells, around the nucleus of the atom, that they don't do so in a purely sequential fashion, that every so often they transition back to filling an interior shell uh, before going back to the outside and continuing along. Uh, but what about the modern definition of a transition element? Uh, is there anything there to consider? And certainly there is. Um, now, when we look for definitions in chemistry, one of the first places we go is to the IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. This is an organization that helps to define standards and nomenclature and terms that we use in chemistry, and they have weighed in on what they believe a transition element is. So if we go to the uh, IUPAC Gold Book here and take a look at its definition of a transition element, what we find is that the IUPAC defines a transition element as an element whose atom has an incomplete D subshell or which can give rise to cations with an incomplete D subshell. Now, this is a pretty good working definition, but it still leads to some debate and a little bit of ambiguity about exactly which elements from the D block qualify as transition metals. So let's take a look at this in a bit more detail. Now, we're familiar by now with uh, orbital filling and the Aufbau principle uh, and how uh, we fill the subshells, which were discovered a little bit later than Bohr and Bury's time. Uh, sequentially in order of their increasing energy. When we do this, what we find is that when we reach scandium through zinc of the uh, fourth row of the table, we begin populating the uh, D subshell. Right? So it would stand to reason that, okay, the entire uh, the entirety of this, this series of elements constitutes transition metals. But remember the IUPAC definition, which is that it has to have a partially filled D subshell in its atoms or ions. So that takes care of most of these elements, but let's look closer at this particular row of the D block and see if we can zero in on where there might be a little bit of controversy. Okay, now let's take a look again, as, as I mentioned, at the fourth row here. Um, now, naturally, um, they all are going to have an argon core in this row in their electron configurations, but potassium and calcium would be the first two. Now, these are filling their 4S subshell and so do not qualify as transition metals. But once we reach scandium, again, based on the Aufbau principle, uh, we find that we find a 4s2, 3d1, and then moving forward, we begin populating the D subshell. So these clearly are transition metals by the IUPAC definition, simply by virtue of the fact that their ground state electron configurations have unfilled D subshells. Uh, chromium is an interesting uh, exception because in the case of chromium, we actually have a 4s1, 3d5 due to the added energy benefit of having that PAF filled D subshell. Moving on to manganese, things get back to normal all the way up through nickel, and then things change. So this series of elements that we've got here, scandium through nickel, most certainly do fit IUPAC's definition of transition elements. However, copper is yet another one of those exceptions to the Aufbau principle. While one might anticipate a 4s2 3d9 electron configuration in its ground state, it actually has 3d10. Uh, adding an additional electron for zinc gives us the closed 4s2 and 3d10 subshells. And so that leaves copper and zinc in question here. We really can't say they're transition elements based upon the ground state electron configurations of their neutral atoms. So let's move on and consider their ions one by one here. Now to do that, I'm going to look at groups 11 and 12 individually. So let's do that starting off with group 11 of the periodic table containing copper, silver, and gold. Okay, these are our transition elements we've already defined. Let's take a look at group 11. Uh, now, copper can form multiple ions. It's known to have various valence states. Um, for example, there's the so-called cuprous ion, copper plus one, and the cupric ion, copper plus two. And as you can see here, in order to form the copper two plus ion, we have to take an electron from that D subshell which means that copper does, in fact, meet the IUPAC definition of a transition element. In fact, this is also true for silver. We know that silver uh, commonly can form both a plus one and plus two ion, and when we look at that plus two ion's electron configuration, we meet the standard for a transition element. And even gold, although we tend to think of gold as an inert metal, gold, in fact, does form ions and does form complexes with ligands and organometallic chemistry, 
and it tends to form valences of plus one and plus three. Now, a plus three gold would give us an electron configuration of 5d8. Now, the, the chemistry here is a bit more complex, and there are even some different electron configurations that we see uh, when we, we make complexes of gold three. However, this is an obvious instance right here. We can clearly say gold three is going to be an ion that contains partially filled D subshell and therefore does qualify it as a transition element. So group 11, in fact, does belong in that definition. Uh, now, there's a paper that I read uh, for this uh, in preparation for this video written by William B. Jensen back in 2003 in Journal of Chemical Education. And Jensen doesn't mince words here. Early in the paper, he shows a figure of what he says is a commonly used periodic table that incorrectly places the zinc group or group 12 into the transition elements. Why would he assert this so early in the paper? Well, because he thinks that this is true. He, he's got evidence here. He's going to make an argument. So why would zinc, cadmium, and mercury not be transition elements? Well, if we think about the common ions and the ground state electron configurations of neutral atoms of these elements, what we find is that zinc, cadmium, and mercury only form plus two ions. And these plus two ions form when electrons are lost from the 6s, 5s, or 4s subshell for these elements. Now, what that means is that that D subshell is completely closed off. It's not acting as a, as a part of the element's chemistry. It's a closed off uh, to use the term that I, I believe uh, Langmuir used, a kernel of electrons that does not participate in the chemistry of the element. And to further drive this home, we can take a look back at Jensen's paper here, in which he pretty clearly shows that when it comes to transition elements, we expect lots of different oxidation states and lots of pretty colored chemistry when they're complexes, which is exactly what we do see for group 11 elements. However, in the case of group 12 elements with zinc, cadmium, and mercury, we don't. We only see these bivalent cations. There's not a lot of fancy colors, and therefore the d orbitals are pretty clearly not participating in the chemistry of these elements. So there's your answer. Transition elements end at group 11 with copper, uh, silver, and gold. And the group 12 elements, zinc, um, cadmium, and mercury, although arguably in the D block, cannot be identified as transition elements. So that's all for today's discussion, everyone. Uh, appreciate your time. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And as always, I'll see you on the next video.